Welcome to my garden this morning. I'm Liz Davey and you're watching A Walk in the Garden on NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable. This series of shows on gardening and also on cooking uh, with some of the things that we pick in the garden is filmed in my garden here in Norfolk. And right now I'm standing in my herb garden in the sun. Today's heat is going up to about 90, so my herbs are already starting, uh, since it's in the sun in the morning, to have a little fold in them. Uh, if I wanted to pick herbs to dry, I would need to get out here a little earlier than now. This is uh, mid to late morning, and my oregano over here is about ready to bloom, and this is an ideal time to pick it and dry it, although you can do it any time. This is a great time to do it, but it's good to do it in the morning, shortly after the dew has dried, but before it starts to kind of bend over and wilt. So the same with the tarragon and it too is uh, ready to go to seed, has uh, seed heads on it. Sage has already bloomed in some spots, a couple of the sprigs on it, those can be cut off, but sage can be also dried for winter use. And some of the other herbs are down in the vegetable garden, we'll pick those a little later when they are ready. But I do have one basil up here that I bought as a plant. And this is a Thai basil and it has some nice purple blooms on top and uh, I can pick that and use it at any time. Lemon balm, lime balm, lemon thyme, lemon verbena, they're all ready. Even the chives can still be picked and used as long as they're uh, putting up the green shoots. I have some valerian in the back, which is a non-edible herb. Uh, it is a medicinal herb, but I don't do that sort of thing with the herbs. I like to grow them, but I do not use them medicinally. At any rate, the seed heads on that had had beautiful, fragrant flowers, but now they have gone by, so it'll be time to cut those off and add them to the compost. I don't really want them to go to seed. If I only had one plant, I would let it go to seed but that has been a little aggressive in that area, so I definitely want to cut off those seed heads before they completely go to seed. Lavender is also in blossom down in front, and that can be picked and used uh, in culinary creations. As long as you don't spray it with anything toxic, uh, it's fine to use in cookies and pastries, and even a few uh, dishes that call for a variety of spices will include lavender blossoms in the mix. Lavender foliage can also be chopped and used and they have the same flavor, though not the color, of the blooms themselves. Now let's move down over to the perennial garden. Right now not too much in the herb garden needs to be done. Occasional weeding, but it's pretty full so weeds don't have a chance to grow. But there are some tasks to do over in the perennial garden. We have quite a bit of things in bloom in the perennial garden right now and some things that are finished blooming. One of those is the lilies, the earlier lilies. And those I need to cut off where they've bloomed. They aren't going to bloom again this year, unfortunately. So we can just cut those back once they're finished. Still got a few blooms here, so I'll leave that one. But we definitely want to just get rid of all those blooms so that we can see the things behind them. Daylilies are going to be blooming uh, within the week. We have some Heliopsis, that's the yellow daisy flower, and also yarrow, a pink yarrow, pink and white yarrow. That's a very good uh, pollinator plant, and you can see if you look very closely, a lot of little pollinators are on it. Not all our pollinators are bees and honeybees. Some of them are very small and they don't sting, but they nonetheless do the job of pollinating plants. As we move along, the aliums that were in bloom are about ready to be cut and saved for winter decorations. 
These are other aliums. These are uh, drumstick aliums. And they're a smaller one. And uh, they have an end kind of like a drumstick. We'll let those continue until they're finished blooming and then I'll cut those off. If I don't cut them off, I will have them all over the garden. Some aliums spread widely and this is one of them. Others are a little more polite, like the larger ones, and they will not spread in the garden that much. But these guys will be all over if I let them go to seed. They grow very well. The coral bells, their first set of blooms is about finished and I can cut those down too as soon as they turn brown. And we'll add all this to the compost. We can expect sporadic bloom from these coral bells throughout the summer. So they're nice to have in the garden. And they add a nice little touch of color and some delicate blooms. There's a few left. We'll just cut off the ones that have gone by. We have some more lilies down here. These are uh, an oriental lily in back. And I haven't decided exactly what the variety is. I believe it's Nettie's Pride, but I've also seen it called Susan's Pride and several other names. This is butterfly weed, and it is a host plant for the monarch butterfly, which I really love to have in the garden. So I enjoy having these blooming. Again, we'll cut them back when they're finished and hope for more blooms. And we hope to see some of those yellow and black caterpillars on it that would be the infant version of the monarch butterfly. And then perhaps find a chrysalis and then see a butterfly emerge. The poppies, we have a nice dragonfly on the poppy right now. I've let these go to seed and they're almost ready to pick. When they turn brown, fully brown in the cap area, again, I'll pick those and they can be sprayed and used in, in holiday decorations. The roses have finished their first flush of bloom for the most part. Uh, there's still a few left. I'm going to deadhead these. But uh, now is the time, and there's a bloom that isn't going to open, so we'll just take it off too. Time to watch them for Japanese beetles, if you have Japanese beetles in your area. If I see any, I hand pick them. So far, I haven't been bothered by too much. The time has come to uh, fertilize the roses for the second time of the season. And I'm gonna use a, a cup of the rose food around each one. And I will scratch it in if I can. Uh, if your rose is kind of closely planted, you may not be able to do much in the way of scratching it in. But we'll try to do the best we can. Then I want to water that in. Roses need about five gallons of water a week. That's about an equivalent of an inch of water. So far this season, we've been pretty lucky but that may change. So if we expect a fall flush of bloom, we need to get out there with the watering can and keep the roses watered. I only have a few, so it isn't too bad a task to keep them watered and fertilized. This is a Veronica, and again, I will deadhead that and expect it to keep putting up bloom stalks. If you look at the base of each of these flowers, you'll see that there are new ones almost ready to form. So you need to uh, kind of watch where they are when you cut off the stalk that's bloomed so you don't go too far. And it will keep blooming this summer. Again, more daylilies will be blooming too to accompany the lilies that are here. Then later lilies will be blooming as well. Black-eyed Susans are budded, and we have butterfly weed and the yellow Coreopsis. I think it's a nice combination. It's certainly bright. And behind it, some purple flowers, a purple and bl or blue phlox. That's uh, one that looks a little blue in some lights and a little pink in others. So throughout the day, it kind of changes color. 
Tradescantia is the purple flower behind along with a rose in the back. And here we have some snapdragons. These I put in as uh, young shoots or young plants that I got at a nursery. I knew it needed a little extra color in here and this was a variety pack. So right now we have a yellow and a pink blooming. We'll see what the rest of them are. There were six of them so they'll be blooming throughout the summer. We do have some larkspur coming up in here and that receded from years past. I really like the larkspur. I think I'll spread some seeds another year because I like to have it coming up between the other things. Again, the coral bells here are pretty much finished and we can take those bloom stalks right off and enjoy the lavender that's near them. Some of the things are quieter, some of them a little more robust. Again, we have more of the lilies in back, the pink lilies, and they have done really well and in fact they've multiplied. So some of them are a little small, smaller than they were when I planted them, but I think they will emerge. The next plant I want to focus on is over on the other side of the garden, and that's Monarda or Bee Balm. I have several varieties. One of them has already bloomed. It was a purple. This one is a red, and it really also adds a lot of color. More poppies, and these again can be cut down. The foliage on the poppies is going to die back pretty much completely before fall when a new flush of foliage will arise. Again, we have more uh, daylilies coming up. And down here, some stackies and poppies. Now these are annual poppies, and they do reseed themselves in this area all all through the season they will uh, bloom right now but they do reseed themselves in the fall so I'll let some of them reseed themselves and I'll gather seeds from others they have the same type of blo uh, blossom as the other poppies and also they have the the capsule that holds the seeds that looks much like the other poppies you can kind of recognize it as a poppy behind it I have the uh, walkers low cat mint, and then more daylilies. It's really kind of a mixed garden right now because we have the self-seeders that are now in bloom. More things will be coming out as the season progresses. I try to plant a mixture throughout the garden so that there will be something in bloom within uh, each season as we go through the summer. Midsummer is a hard time in some instances because you have your spring blooms and bulbs, but then comes summer and sometimes not quite as much color. And you're waiting for the fall blooms of the chrysanthemums and other fall flowers. Now let's move over to the vegetable garden. There's plenty to do there. I'm in the vegetable garden and it's a time of change here too. Uh, some of the early crops are ready to go. This lettuce is pretty much going to seed. It started to. And we'll be pulling that and composting it and making room for another crop. Some of the other lettuce needs to be picked and used as quickly as possible before it goes to seed. And we'll do that. And again, this opens up a spot for planting another crop. Soon it will be time to plant for fall, believe it or not, even though it's the high summer right now in early July but we can start thinking about spaces for fall planting. My broccoli didn't do so well the first crop. Uh, it got eaten, and I was lucky to find six little broccoli sprouts. Now, these are young plants. They've been growing in these pots. They're pretty root-bound, but I'm gonna take a chance and see if we can plant them and have them uh, ready for some fall broccoli. I'll need to watch these and keep them watered. I'm going to separate the roots a bit so that maybe they'll branch out inside the uh, hole that I planted it in. We'll 
We'll plant them at the same level that they were. And I can get two in this area and then two further up and then I'll have to find another spot to put two more. Again, I may just pull some of the roots completely off as I plant these. I'll keep them watered well, at least for the first week or so. This area gets a little shade. As you can see, we're in the shade right now. In the afternoon, it will get a little hotter. I'll keep them watered, draw the mulch up close around them. I also will use a product called Spinosad. Uh, it is one of the ingredients in the organic insecticides, and it does help with those little cabbage worms that uh, will infest the broccoli and make it less than vegetarian. And if I see a lot of holes, and this one has some of the holes, so I have sprayed that once. I had it under cover, but uh, something bigger than a cabbage worm was eating on it as well, which is why I only am have about three plants left. But by adding these other six, I might get a good broccoli crop this fall. Again, keeping it watered is something I need to do. I'm gonna move over now. I've already planted some more greens. This is arugula. And I had taken, uh, there was a little space in here where some of the flowers didn't come up that well. So I added some arugula in place of them. The celery is doing well. The fennel has really taken off. This is a new crop for me this year. They seem to be falling over. We had a little wind last weekend, which knocked a few of the plants over. The parsley, old parsley, I can still use. In fact, I think a lot of it went to seed right where it was growing. And we seem to have some new parsley coming up. I also have a new row of parsley over on the other side. You can see that the old parsley from last year is now going to seed. And if I want to save seeds, all I have to do is wait a little bit until they dry and I will have parsley seeds from this crop. I might give it a try this year. The tomatoes are staked and in cages. If I just used a cage, because I have so many rocks in this soil, I think they would all fall over. So I do add a stake and then I tie the tomato to the stake and I use a piece of cloth to do that. And the cloth that I'm going to use is uh, from a pair of very cheap pantyhose, dollar store. You can cut a dollar store pair of pantyhose into any number of plant ties. And it works really well. It's soft, so it doesn't cut into the stem. And I just figure it around the pole and just tie it tie it up. We're trying to keep them up off the ground as much as possible. This helps keep the slugs away from uh, eating the fruit when they do come through. I also try to keep them inside the cage if possible. So another little task is just to, when I'm weeding or looking at them as they grow, pull the shoots back into the cages. This cage is a little precarious probably needs to be reset or another stake put in. Moving over this way, I've already taken the netting off the strawberries and the peas are still producing an occasional pea, but I've taken out the shell peas. The snap peas are soon to go, as are the snow peas. We've had a good run of peas. I've been able to put some in the freezer for fall use, and we've had, certainly had a lot of stir fries with the snow peas and a lot of other meals with the snap peas and the shell peas. So they've been a good crop this year. Our late spring had a lot to do with that, but it's time now to take them down and take down the fence. I've already planted some onion sets that I had left over in the spot where the shell peas were. So again, we're reusing the space where possible to add crops that'll go into fall. I'm still able to pick these onions and use them as uh, a little more than green onions. They're uh, 
starting to make bulbs on the bottom. So I want to get them separated a little bit so that they aren't too close together and we'll get some bigger onions for fall harvest. This plant is borage and it's an herb. It has very pretty flowers and it's a pollinator favorite. The herb is edible. The little flowers can be used in salads and the leaves, the younger leaves, are, can be used also. They taste a bit like cucumbers. They are a bit hairy, which is a little off-putting, but the taste is there if you're uh, craving a little cucumber flavor. Herbs are growing well. We have basil coming, and we can start picking some of the tops off the basil. The more you separate it, the better it will grow. I always have a few flowers that come up here and there in the garden, just like the borage does and I usually leave them at least for a while. The beans already have blossoms, and that means beans will be here shortly. I have both green and yellow beans, and once you start to see tiny beans, you know that you will be picking beans in another week or so. Brussels sprouts are doing well, and the summer squash I uncovered. I had the summer squash covered early in the season, to try to prevent squash borers. I don't know how successful we were, we'll, we'll see later. But now that it's blossoming, you have to take off the cover because it needs to be pollinated and the insects need to be able to get to those blossoms. So once I started to see the blossoms on the zucchini, I took off the cover. The cucumbers are on the teepee and I planted a few extras. They only take about 50 days, so we planted those about two weeks ago, and they're already up quite well because we have had some hot weather, which is nice cucumber weather. And we'll start training those to these strings as the plants get a little larger so that it will climb rather than sprawl. It saves a little space in the garden. You can also do that with pole beans. Uh, rather than growing them on a single pole, you can set up some teepees for pole beans. I have done that in the past. Coming over towards blueberries, our uh, strawberries are gone, but blueberries are coming. And every year I'm unsuccessful with blueberries because the birds have a feast. This year I decided I was going to have some blueberries. So I used my strawberry netting and I built a little uh, temporary cage for my blueberries. And hopefully this has so far worked. I see some blueberries that are almost ready to pick. I know that the local farms that have blueberries, ha the you pick berries, are ready. So I'm ready too. I have a couple more blueberry bushes back behind my flower bed and they are loaded with berries. So I'm trying to figure out a way to also cover those. Or maybe I'll let the birds have those and I'll have these. Time will tell. These are tomatillos. And again, with the wind, they started to fall over. So I did add some supports, some wire supports. These are the cut up uh, tomato cages and just to get, help hold them up a little bit. My garden's starting to get crowded in spots and hard to pick. I also have raspberries on the other side, speaking of berries. And the raspberries have, have a net over them as well. They're on the far side of the garden. And without the net, the birds would completely clean me out there. So. We do have to net the fruit if we want some. They'll still be able to get underneath and get a few. And I'm sure they'll find their way into this one as well and have their fill of blueberries. But perhaps I'll get a few. Now let's head back to the shade garden. It's always cool in the shade garden. I probably weed this garden more simply because it's pleasant to work in when it's hot. And we've had a nice spell of hot weather. The ferns look pretty. Uh, we've also had enough moisture that things haven't wilted back here. And the hostas are starting to bloom. I have a number of hosta. My husband wondered how many one day and counted them. I think he counted 70. So they're not all the same, not all different varieties, but 70 total plants here and there. Uh, they kind of fill in nicely. And when they're in bloom, they're pretty. This one has a white bloom, some of them have a purple bloom, some of them have a striped bloom. And we'll let them bloom. I like, I like the blooms. Some people cut them off if they just want the foliage, but I like the blooms. Some of them are even quite fragrant. 
But once the bloom is gone, I do cut them off. The seed heads are kind of ugly. So I will cut off and compost those particular ones after they've finished with their bloom. I've added a few annuals, a few impatiens. We started from seed in, uh, oh, I think it was February inside, if you happen to be watching the show then. We started some impatiens, and I've popped in a few of those. They also fill containers here and there in the garden. I've had fairly good luck with uh, starting impatience in the house and then bringing them out to fill in later on. This is another thing that I grew in the house uh, in the early spring, and this is a caladium. And I planted five of the little bulbs. They come in a bag of five where I received them. It is a bulb that you order in the spring. Speaking of bulbs, it's time to think about ordering your bulbs for fall planting. All of the companies are putting out their catalogs now, and the websites are busy as well. If you have specific varieties you want for fall planting, for spring blooming, now is the time to get them. These you order in the spring, and they are ordered along with begonias and several other spring bulbs. Dahlias are another one and that can be ordered in the springtime instead of the fall. And these are planted inside where it's warm. They really like the soil to be about 70 degrees, which in our neck of the woods doesn't happen until about now, July. So you need to start them inside. I used a, a hot mat underneath them and put them in a shallow container. I've left some in containers for another area of my garden. But this is one of the bulbs, and it really adds a lot of color to the garden. They are generally white, green, and pink. And there are a variety of different patterns that the leaves can take on. It is a tender bulb. It's a tropical. So you can try to save the bulb that's underneath in the fall. I haven't had much luck with that with the caladiums. They seem to just kind of bloom their hearts out during the season and not leave much for the next season. But they're really nice to start a few in the winter, watch them grow, and then put them out in the summer when you have those holes where the bulbs were. Your spring bulbs leave a spot once their foliage is gone, and you need something to fill it. Caladiums work nicely for that, as do dahlias in the sun and some of the other summer bulbs will work there too to take the place of bulbs that uh, the eucomus or pineapple lilies are an example of a bulb that will start inside in the winter and then put out in the summer to fill those spaces where the daffodils and the tulips were and have gone by. Going back towards the pond, we finally have some frogs in the pond. I don't put them in, they just come. Uh, plant a water in a spot and keep it clean and maybe have a few bugs around and the frogs will come. And I have two different varieties. I have green frogs and that's the one that we have out here now. And then I also have leopard frogs and they have, they don't have the green on them, but they have a more distinct leopardy appearance. There are several other native New England frogs, but these are the two that I seem to see most often. I also have toads, but the toads generally are in the foliage and not in the pond, though they do bear their young in water. I'm not sure they use my pond. We do have other areas that are wet and kind of vernal ponds all over in this area on my property. So they are very wet in the spring, and I think that's where the frogs and the, particularly the toads do their breeding. But I do have frogs that come to the pond in the summer and uh, spend their summer vacation with me. So we enjoy watching them along with the fish, and the fish as usual are hungry. As the weather gets warm, the fish eat, want to eat more often. So we keep the fish food handy. It always takes them a while to figure out where the food is, but now they come, whenever they see feet on the boardwalk here, they come to this area where I always put the food and crowd around to catch it as it falls into the water or even come up and get it on top. 
Frogs and fish metabolisms go along with the weather. They're more active when it's hot and uh, less active and almost sluggish when it's cool. So it's been hot the last few days and I'm sure with the dark bottom on this pond, the water gets fairly warm. And some days they are really scooting around, especially a little later in the day when the sun comes in here. My water plants are doing well. We fertilized them a couple weeks ago. We'll fertilize them again in another two weeks. And the youngest ones are starting to put on some larger leaves, which is a nice sign to see. I do keep them over in the winter inside. They barely make it, usually. And then they come back in the summer when I can get them out into the warm water. The container plants that you have out need to be fed much more often than other plants in the garden that can draw on the soil and the nutrients there. These have kind of a limited supply of nutrients in the soil. And so I water those. When I water them, I add a little of the uh, soluble fertilizer for just the container plants. And they will need watering more often when the so sun is hot. But you'll notice that when the humidity is high, they uh, do retain the moisture a little better. So you can just kind of put your finger on the soil and see how damp it is. Window boxes are particularly vulnerable, especially if they're in the sun. Some of those might need water almost every day. Now let's move over to the other side of the shade garden. This area of the garden, it's dappled shade in the morning and full shade in the afternoon. And the shade plant that was growing here was a goat's beard and we had the tall white blooms two weeks ago. Those have been cut off, and the reason I cut the goat's beard off is because I don't want any more goat's beard. And it tends to really like this area and will reseed prolifically if allowed to. So I do cut it off, and then I go through and pull up some of them every spring because I usually miss at least one. Here's a little teeny bloom right here. So we'll probably still have a few baby goat's beard. This is a stilby on the other hand, and a st I will let that one go to seed. I like a stilby, and uh, it comes in various colors, and it has pink or red blossoms on it, and it looks fairly attractive as it turns brown. So I'll leave those seed heads, and they can be a nice filler for fall arrangements, af even after they've turned brown. We have more hosta here. This one is going to have a uh, purple bloom. And we also have a lot of jewel weed that comes up. And that I pull, at least in some of the areas. This is supposed to soothe inflammation if you get poison ivy. It will not prevent poison ivy, but it will soothe inf inflammation if you do get it. Again, more goat's beard over this way. And more astilbe over here. This clump is fairly large and probably should be divided next year. This is a maidenhair fern, and it seems to be very happy in this location. I've tried other locations without great success. I'm always on the lookout for poison ivy, as it does come up here and there. So when I'm weeding, I have to be very careful not to encounter it. We have a lot more in the way of hostas over here, and a little more astilbe of a different variety. That one's a little taller. There are many astilbes, uh, red ones and pink ones also. I kind of like the white, it's cool in the summer and it does bloom in the summer. Lots of ferns and the ferns were not planted except for one which is back in the back and it was a tall fern which is hard to see but I planted that one and the rest just grew. They liked the location and so they grew all by themselves, I didn't have to do a thing, which is always a nice way to garden. Now let's go back towards the house. Hanging baskets really suffer when the temperature is over 90 and they sit in the sun. And one of the ways that I like to keep my baskets watered is to just put them into a basin of water and leave them there for the day. This will uh, allow the water to seep right in to the container, especially when you have a container that has the moss or fiber 
lining. You want to get it really saturated. So I'll just leave it there until it's nice and saturated. I might repeat that a couple times a week with some watering of the top in between. You just, with a watering can, it seems I can't get the soil completely saturated and it dries out very quickly. This works, you can even use a garbage can if you don't have a big dish pan or something to put it in, or one of the trucks will also work, but it needs to go in something where you can kind of immerse it in water. This would work too for a window box if you have, again, one that's lined with moss or fiber and you need to put it in water, but you're going to need some kind of a container to put it in that's a little larger, maybe even a kiddie pool if you happen to have one and then you can really soak it down on these hot days. Those I tend to use the watering can, but the water does tend to leak out as fast as it goes in. So it doesn't really get saturated as much as you think it does. Hanging plants that are in the sun sometimes can use water twice a day if they're really in the sun and it's hot. If the humidity is high, it may help a little bit, but if the humidity is low and you have a little wind, they will dry out very quickly. This is a good thing to do if you're going on vacation too, uh, or away for a weekend and you know it's gonna be hot. Just put your plants in a container of water and let them soak it up while you're gone. And then they'll be all okay instead of all dried out and dead when you get home. Now let's go inside and cook with some of those lovely herbs that we've been picking in the garden. It's fun to work in the kitchen in the summer when you have all the fresh herbs outside to pick and use whenever you wish. Uh, it means you don't have to go to the store and get something when you want to spur the moment, make something a little special and have some fresh herbs to use. Today I'm going to make some rolls, a main dish salad and a yummy dessert. And I'm going to start with the rolls and this is a basic biscuit recipe and it's two cups of flour, a tablespoon of baking powder, a teaspoon of salt, and a half cup of shortening and you can use you could use butter if you wished it would be a little hard to, harder to cut in but shortening or whatever margarine whatever you'd like to use you can cut that in and that's what I've done already and I've cut it in to make crumbs and uh, you see a, li a little bit of the roughness to the mixture it's not completely smooth and then we'll add three quarters of a cup of milk all at once and stir it around to make our dough. I'll turn that out onto my floured board and I'm going to try to see if I can get it to hold together a little first. And then I'll bring it together and knead it a few times. I don't want to manhandle it too much, just uh, gently knead it until it comes together nicely. Five or six turns should be enough. Then I'm going to roll this out to about a 13 inch circle and try to keep my edges somewhat smooth and keep it somewhat circular. Roll from the middle out. Pulling in the edge occasionally to encourage the circuit. And 
and I can use a ruler to see how big it is and it's about 13 inches just what we wanted I do keep a ruler in the kitchen it's very handy to have as part of your kitchen equipment now the fun begins I've melted a tablespoon of butter and I'm going to brush that on the dough And then you can add the topping of your choice. And I'm going to use some Parmesan cheese and some parsley, as these are a more savory roll. If you wanted to make a sweet roll out of this, you could use uh, brown sugar and cinnamon instead. Or you could use another type of cheese and perhaps another herb. I'm going to use some parsley. But any of the other herbs from the garden, rosemary would be good. Other types of cheeses. And if you wanted, you could just roll them and cut them in circles, small circles. I'm going to make roll-ups with this. I'm going to add about a tablespoon of the uh, chopped parsley. Again, fresh from the garden. Maybe even a little more. That piece didn't get chopped. And then I'm going to cut this into 12 pieces. Start out by cutting it in quarters, and then cut each quarter into thirds. And since 3 times 4 is still 12, we'll have our dozen pieces. going to roll them up from the outside and put them on the baking sheet. Move this down as we unroll and put the pointed side down as we do this. These will go into a 425 degree oven for about 15 minutes. Watch them carefully so that they get nice and brown but not burned. They don't take very long so you don't have to have the oven on too long. If I have things to do in the oven I prefer to do it early in the morning when it's still cool and then have it ready for later in the day. The next thing we're going to do is a main dish salad. This is a nice thing for a hot day, and it's also something that you could take to a potluck supper if you're invited to one. And I'm going to start with my trifle bowl. 
usually used for dessert with your lady fingers around the edge and your pudding and fruit in the middle and sprinkled with the spirit of your choice. But today I'm going to use it for my salad just because it looks pretty in the bowl. And a layered salad always looks the best in a straight sided glass bowl. I have several different bowls I like this. I have one that just sits flat. And you can find these. Sometimes uh, even a vase will work if you have a plain straight sided vase. And I'm going to start out with a layer of chopped lettuce. Remember we have plenty of that out in the garden. And on top of that I'm going to add two cups of or macaroni uh, shells that have been cooked and I started with two cups. I'm using two cups of lettuce and two cups of cooked macaroni. It was two cups before it was cooked. And that's our next layer. And I thought since this is a uh, salmon salad, having the shell shape kind of in keeping with the theme. Then I'm going to add half a cup of sliced pimento stuffed olives. We need the, and again, try to kind of keep them in layers so that you're going to be able to see those layers around the edge of the bowl. One more olive. Two cups of chopped tomatoes. And local tomatoes are starting to come in. They aren't fully ripe, and they aren't ripe definitely in my garden, but you may be able to get some local tomatoes now. And two cups of sliced cucumbers. They too are starting. And again, you want to keep some layers here. And I'm going to add a pound of cooked flaked salmon. And this I cooked last night when I was making dinner. Just stuck it in the oven and baked it and then uh, cooled it and flaked it, refrigerated it. So this is a main dish salad. Then we make a dressing to put on it and I start with a cup and a half of mayonnaise and I'm going to add a quarter of a cup, let's see if we can move it so you can see a little, a quarter of a cup of Italian dressing and this is just oil and vinegar and Italian seasoning that I mixed up but you could use bottled dressing just as well. And we'll add that to the mayonnaise along with a tablespoon of chopped onion. and about a teaspoon and a half of fresh chopped dill. And again, this came from right from the garden. And I'm going to mix that all together. We'll coat the top of the salad with this mixture. And I'm going to just seal it in by completely coating the top. There are a number of salad recipes like this. Uh, some have meat or fish and some do not. This particular one has salmon and it's kind of refreshing on a hot summer day. This will be tossed together as you serve it, but let everybody enjoy the nice layering before then. We can garnish it with a little more dill and maybe a radish if you still have some of those left in the garden. And the salad is ready to go for dinner or 
any other time. Now the next thing I want to do is a dessert. The first thing I'm going to do is make a chocolate sauce. And uh, in order to do that I have a cup of chocolate chips and three quarters of a cup of heavy cream. And I'm going to heat the heavy cream in the saucepan. One high, let's get out as much as we can here. And the formula for a good chocolate sauce would be equal amounts of chocolate and cream. But you'll notice I said I had three quarters of a cup of cream and a cup of chocolate chips, but it turns out to be equal in weight. So it's by weight, not by volume. If you use a cup of cream, it'll probably be a little too thin. And if you use less chocolate, it wouldn't be, it just wouldn't turn out quite right. So equal by weight. And what I'm going to do is bring the cream to a boil and then stir it into the chocolate. Okay, our cream has come to a boil and I'm going to add it to the chocolate chips. And let it sit for a minute. And then we're going to just stir and stir and stir gently. It looks like it never going to come together. And then all of a sudden it does. And it will thicken up a bit as it cools. But this is one of the best and easiest chocolate sauces that you'll ever find. And it certainly is quick to make. You have the ingredients on hand. And the next thing I'm going to do is use a chocolate pie crust. Now you can make it yourself using chocolate cookie crumbs. There's recipes on the back of the packages of wafers. You can use uh, Oreos. You can use chocolate graham crackers, the famous chocolate wafers, which are kind of expensive, or you can make your own. I made my own and then mixed it with a quarter, uh, two cups of crumbs with the quarter cup of melted butter and a quarter cup of confectioner's sugar, put it in the pie shell and baked it at 375 for about 15 minutes. I put a empty pie plate in it. A lot of recipes tell you to use parchment and beans or something like that. I find beans kind of messy. An empty aluminum pie pan works just as well to hold down the crust while it bakes and then for the last few minutes you take it off. And now I'm going to coat the inside of this with a little of the chocolate. And I did have it in the freezer, so it should uh, coat fairly easily. And I can use a brush, perhaps, too, if I wanted to. But I just want to coat the inside a little bit. It will harden up in the freezer. brush might have been a good idea, but the teaspoon works as well. Ideally you would put this crust back into the freezer for a few minutes and so that this mixture would harden up. I had the crust in the freezer before we started in hopes that that would speed the process of it hardening up, and I think it did. The next thing we want to add is ice cream. Your own or purchased. And I've let this sit out just a little bit to get uh, a bit soft. Probably could be a bit softer. But I want to have a nice layer of ice cream. If we stick to the edges, I think it will. The idea is to have a fairly smooth layer of ice cream. And you can mount it up. You could use two different kinds if you wanted. This is coffee ice cream. So I have kind of a mocha pie going. You could use a graham cracker crust as well. 
with uh, strawberry ice cream or another flavor of your choice. Still pretty frozen in the middle. Ice cream used to come uh, in quarts. This is 15 ounces, which is a little less than a quart, as are many packages these days. It seems that instead of reducing, increasing the price, they reduce the size of the package. And then they increase the price ultimately. So, If you're using older recipes, it is something to watch, though, because if it calls for a certain volume of a canned or frozen item, sometimes you have to buy two packages these days. And it's kind of melting as I go. Just a little more. And I think we can smooth out the top. This will go back into the freezer and you can put some whipped cream on it to serve it or you can just drizzle it with a little more of the uh, chocolate sauce or you can do both whipped cream and chocolate sauce. It makes a cool summer dessert for a meal on the porch. So we have our Main dish salad, and here are the Parmesan rolls that came out of the oven, and a mocha ice cream pie for dessert. I'll bring over a few flowers from the garden, decorate the table a little bit, and we have a nice meal for on the porch on a nice summer evening. I'm Liz Davey, and you've been watching A Walk in the Garden with me, Liz Davey, on NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable Television. Join me again for another segment as we travel through the garden, seeing what's available to cook with and what we can do to preserve our harvest. <music>